um, attend today. There it is. Fantastic. So we've got a really great mix of, of members and supporters on the call, lots of familiar faces and some people new to the network. So fantastic to have you all joining us. Um, welcome all to a few, uh, welcome to a few special guests as well. We've got a number of staff from uh, local schools joining mm -hmm. in just to see what the, the local food industry is all about and, and also build on some of the connections between industry and schools, which are being developed through programs like PTEC and the Regional Industry Education Partnerships Program and also uh, the STEM Industry Schools Partnerships Program. So fantastic to have um, some of the uh, teaching staff from local schools on board as well. For those that, that uh, I haven't met, I'm Alex Blow. I manage the day-to-day -day operations of the Food Alliance. I'm joined by Frank Zamet. Um, Frank's the Executive Director of the Food Alliance and he also heads up our parent organisation, um, Central Coast Industry Connect. Um, most people I think will be familiar with the Food Alliance. For those who aren't, and I guess particularly our guests, we're a not-for-profit um, organisation. We exist to support the development of a thriving agri-food industry here on the coast. We do that by promoting and facilitating collaboration across different players um, in the local agri-food value chain, as well as working directly with businesses, helping them to unlock growth opportunities and, and solve problems. Uh, so in terms of the agenda for today's session, Frank and I will kick things off with a, a brief update on some of our uh, key projects. We're lucky to be joined by a couple of really cool uh, local business founders, Olivia Duffin from Duff's Ice Cream and Mikel Overgaard from Crickets & Co., um, they're going to share some insights around their journey as, as entrepreneurs. We'll hear from a couple of members um, of our uh, Food Alliance Steering Committee, Mark Harry from Mars and Nadia O'Connell from Fires Creek. We're going to talk a little bit about um, their background and some of the challenges through COVID um, and what they're focused on uh, looking ahead in terms of business strategy and opportunities. Then we'll open up the floor to everyone, an opportunity to ask questions, um, share news or stories, put out calls for help or float opportunities for collaboration. So um, a chance for everyone to, uh, to get involved and then we'll wrap up about 1.30. Sound okay? Couple of thumbs up, couple of nods, fantastic. Please do enjoy your lunch. Um, again, make sure in the chat box, if you've just joined us, Pop your name on what you're having for lunch just um, to help everybody uh, get some line of sight of, of who's on board and just make it okay for people to be eating their lunch during the session uh, as well. So um, in terms of big projects, I'll, I'll kick off with a couple and then Frank, I'll, I'll, I'll get you to dive in. Um, a couple of, of the big ones that we've got on the go at the moment are related to the New South Wales government's bushfire economic recovery fund. And we were successful with two grant applications earlier in the year. The first of those projects is around supporting the scale up of the uh, Meet the Maker Trail food tourism platform. Some people might be familiar with that and, and seen it promoted over the last couple of years. It's a platform that exists um, to deliver bookable behind the scenes access to some of our um, artisan producers. And our project is aimed at enabling more businesses to become involved and benefit from the platform and also promote the platform more widely to uh, local interstate and, and obviously at, at some point uh, international tourists. So we'll be working with local business and tourism experts to build uh, a strategy to um, increase the reach and, and impact of the Maker Trail and also a marketing plan. We'll be working on that over the next couple of months. Um, and when we'll kick off a range of promotional activities uh, in early in the new year, uh, which will stretch across um, the majority of, of 2022. So that'll be a mix of um, improvements to the website, um, social media um, promotion, and also uh, looking to promote it in, in trade press and, um, and other general uh, press as well. So the Maker Trail gives us a really exciting opportunity to tap into the surge of consumer interest in uh, the origins of food and local sourcing, and also that um, increase that we're seeing in consumers' desire to connect to maker stories. And we also see the Maker Trail as a really uh, um, valuable tool in helping enhance 
the coast's reputation as a, as a foodie destination. And fundamentally, we've got a, a huge population catchment who are hungry for domestic travel experiences. So the size of the prize for the Maker Trail is really significant, which makes this project um, a really important one. The second uh, major project I wanted to touch on is um, around the delivery of a Central Coast Industry Festival. So this will comprise a program of events across two weeks in August uh, next year, um, which will include industry and community education sessions, capability building workshops, um, and a three-day industry expo, which will offer networking and business development opportunities to um, organisations who participate. So the festival gives us a chance to showcase some of the, the real strengths of the region in terms of our food, beverage, agri and advanced manufacturing sectors, um, and helps to promote both the region and those industries to businesses, to government agencies and, and other stakeholders. So there'll be, and there'll also be opportunities for students to engage with industry throughout the festival as we look to promote um, employment and skills development pathways um, and also strengthen the, the local talent pipeline for the benefit of, of businesses. So we're really grateful for the enthusiasm and support that we've already um, enjoyed around these projects. We've had a lot of input um, and advocacy from uh, people within the network already. Um, and we're looking forward to partnering with many of our members and, uh, and other local organisations within the network to deliver those projects successfully. So they're, um, they're kicking off uh, uh, now and we'll keep it posted as those um, projects evolve over the coming months. Now, Frank, are you good now? I'll hand over to you. Yes, to yeah, no, on, sorry about that. Yeah, I've all had, um, hydrogen. Uh, yep, yeah, um, I just had a couple of people having trouble uh, hearing for some reason but anyway um yeah thanks alex um yeah so look um the, the i suppose the only news i want to give and there's been a bit of media around it uh, in the last week or so around the um us signing an mou with uh, star scientific uh and the the mou is about um looking at their technology which is basically uh, um they've developed this catalyst material and when you run uh, hydrogen and oxygen across the material, it generates heat and water. So there's no combustion, um, but um, and it's clean energy. So, um, and the I suppose the, the 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 big opportunity is, as we know in food processing, there's a lot of heat used, whether it's in heating water, steam for cooking or baking, or even heating oil, you know, through. Um, through a heat exchanger um, is a great opportunity for uh, carbon-free um, manufacturing. So um, um, it's the technology isn't hasn't been commercialised yet, and um, the whole um, the MOU talks about uh, we've established a Central Coast hydrogen food cluster, uh, and we've got uh, the, the four major food companies at this point uh, sort of part of that that group. Um, and uh, Mars are going to be the, uh, the first cab off the rank to do a pilot, uh, which will be around heating water for their cleaning processes. Um, but you can well imagine if, if we're successful in um, being able to deliver this project, it's probably going to take 12 to 18 months um, um, because a whole lot of, there's a lot of issues around regulation, and that's probably where a lot of the time is going to be, um, uh, be taken, uh, at crossing those bridges. Um, but you know, if we're successful, it will definitely rev revolutionise um, the whole food processing area. Um, so, Star talk about they don't um, they're, they're on about heat. They don't talk about hydrogen. They talk about heat. So, uh, and they their their process will be if you want heat, you you buy the heat from them and they set everything up. That's that's how it's going to work in theory. And um, but yeah, like I say, we're We've got a way to go, uh, but you know, at least the ball's rolling, which is great. And it's exciting. It's happening here on the Central Coast. Um, they've had numerous uh, contacts from overseas, and particularly New Zealand, uh, because a lot of milk, milk powder over there uh, gets dried. Uh, milk gets dry for milk powder. Um, and um, everyone's searching for that um, carbon-free heat. Um, so, yeah. Um, and it's great that they've decided to work in their backyard. And they're based at Berkeley Vale and uh, with, with the major food companies just around them. So, yeah, exciting time. So I think that's probably the, the, the 
the uh, the only news I want to talk about at the moment. There's some other things that are happening, which we really, um, until we pr progress a little bit more, we're probably not. It's probably not the right time to discuss those. But um, um, look, there's a lot uh, happening um, over the over the coming months. So um, you know, it's an exciting time actually for the region. So um, you know, certainly from a food perspective. So looking forward to uh, continuing that journey. Good on you, um, Frank. That's it. I'd like to do. Um, so I forgot. Did you mention uh, that Steve and Scott were on on the call? You know, two directors. Sorry, I, was... I have. I haven't, mate. No. Okay. Yeah. So I just we've got um, two. Oh, Carl. Two of our directors that are on on board with us now. Scott Henshaw, um, who just joined us recently. Um, uh, he works for uh, Forsyth Recruitment, and uh, Stephen Hyde, who's the chair of our organisation, who also runs Trendpack. Uh, a, a big family business here on the coast in Berkeley Vale. So, um, yeah, so welcome to, welcome to the, those two guys. That's it for me. Is, is there any questions around the Maker Trail, the uh, industry festival or hydrogen? You can either ask them out loud or you can pop any questions in the text box and we'll, we'll look to answer them as we're moving through. Comments, questions? If you think of anything, we'll have some time for questions. At the Alex, end as well. where are you going to hold the three-day expo? It sounds fantastic. What location are you looking at on the coast? I think the majority of it will be doing at um, Mingara. Uh, there'll be some events outside of that as well and some virtual events uh, also. But I think the, the core of what we're looking to do will be uh, at Mingara, Katrina. So an opportunity for some... Um, some in real life connections after 18 months of, of virtual stuff, which I think will be really, really valuable. Obviously touching wood that um, things remain um, as positive as they are at the moment. Yeah, just on that, um, we're working with Jill too, Petrino, but there's, the, there's one day dedicated to having schools come through as well. Um, so um, look, we're, we're at very early stages. We only just signed a funding deed and um, we'll, we're just in the process, um, just getting things sorted. Alex will be running both projects. Um, we'll probably, well, we will have a committee um, um, that'll support Alex in terms of the activities across the two weeks and on, on the three days and that'll cover all the different aspects of what we want to yeah. Um, want to do so we've got a bit of work to do yet yeah. i mean we've we framed something up for the funding obviously but th there are other opportunities so we'll just have to see how we can fit everything in oh having the school kids is just fantastic because that's part of the biggest strategy for our talent pool for these employers so i applaud that that's fantastic frank and alex yep. well good good on you patrona and, and ian thanks for your question around the maker trail we're, we're looking at a um a formal launch in april um, so, but before then, I think we, we'll look to engage with businesses who've expressed interest in becoming part of the Maker Trail and part of the development of the strategy, some guardrails for new businesses who want to join. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll start to socialise those as we build them up and, um, and make sure that anyone who's already um already expressed some interest in becoming part of the trail is is um, sort of onboarded if you like um, and then we'll promote um, the trail and invite other businesses who might want to participate as well but there's a bit of work to do just to ensure that there is a bit of a framework around the kinds of offers that um, uh, the kinds of sort of service that needs to be provided or the product of the food tourism product that needs to be provided um, as part of the maker trial to make sure that there's a consistent offer and one that's sort of relevant for consumers so yeah it's um but really exciting the thought that we've got some great businesses who already um have sort of consumer facing parts of their business um to be able to tie that into the maker trail is, is really cool it allows us to scale it up and and broaden the the, the type of um uh, products that can be involved in the maker trail as well so any other questions around those projects all right cool if you do think of things pop them in the text box and as i say there'll be an opportunity for some more questions towards the end as well um, anyone who's joined us late pop your name and your business name in the in the chat box and let us know what you're having for lunch i think kyle <laughs> Welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Um, everyone's, because we're having a lunch meeting, um, people, some people are eating their lunch. 
Um, and we've just asked them to pop in what they're having to, to, to get interesting to see the variety of, of uh, really interesting lunches around the place. So the next thing we're going to do is um, I just wanted to talk about, uh, we have been working really hard uh, to drive awareness of CC, CCFA um, across the region, really pleasing to see as a result, our membership base continues to grow. And um, uh, our recent new members include a really cool mix of, of entrepreneurial early stage food businesses who have come to us looking for help to scale up. And I'm grateful um, to Olivia and Mikel for making time to participate in some Q&A. So we get to hear a little of, a bit about their entrepreneurial journey. Um, so I'm going to start with Olivia, um, and I might ask you, Liv, just to introduce yourself, your business, talk a little bit about what you're doing, you know, what you make and, and how you're doing it, um, and perhaps a bit of background on how you got into starting your own business. And then I've got a couple of questions, and then hopefully we'll have some time for the, um, the group to ask a couple of questions as well. So fire away, Liv. Sure. Thanks, Alex. I'm Olivia. Um, I studied food science and human nutrition at the University of Newcastle, and I did one year of it also at Deakin in Melbourne. So I got a really broad um, and different kind of experience at you going to two. Um, I then was an intern for Mars Food um, while I was still at university. And then I got onto the Mars Graduate Program, uh, which was a three-year program at both food and briefly in chocolate in Ballarat. Um, so that was really cool to get even more breadth um, so early on in my career. Um, so I have worked in the food industry now for six years. Um, and after Mars, I, I worked at Mars in research and development, so with on Alex's team. <laughs> and um, that was in both product development and quality assurance. Um, and after Mars, I moved down to another, just a different food company in, um, in Sydney. Um, but soon I realised that I just wanted to do my own thing. I had a strong passion for ice cream. Um, and I always have, I've always been really interested in ice cream. Um, and I just thought there's no ice cream company doing the, the style that I want to do. And I had some really good ideas. And my, my dad actually had always had his own businesses. He was very entrepreneurial and was an inventor and all these amazing things. And I thought it, it seemed very normal to me to, you know, go and create your own um, company. So I started Duff's Ice Cream, which is a handcraft ice cream company um, on the coast. So I'm on the north end at Noraville um, and actually making work from a very small ice cream truck. It's a vintage 1981 Ford <laughs> Transit. Um, so it's got, you know, little ice creams on the front. It's very, very old school. Um, so I, having the product development background, I create all my recipes for all of my ice creams um, and I develop them, including I've now started some dairy free, which um, has gone really well. People love dairy free. Um, and yeah, so I try and do, I have an e-commerce store where you can pre-order tubs um, and my ice cream is very textural. So it's kind of about having a chunk and a chew and something gooey swelled through it. Um, and yeah, just really delicious flavors. I also make ice cream sandwiches, which can be purchased from my truck. So the sales line of my business comes through my e-commerce store mainly. And then I do pop-ups with the truck where you can buy items at the truck, pick up your orders. Um, and that's kind of my distribution network. So I drive around the coast in little pop-up areas um, on the weekends and try and, yeah, try and go all different places to meet all different people. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the introduction. <laughs> oh, good on you, Liv. How, how good's your energy? Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> You really get a sense of um, how much energy you're getting from from your own business, and um, and I guess uh, obviously that comes with some challenges. What, what what's been the toughest parts? You think of of getting things off the ground? What have been the major sort of frustrations? I suppose of of starting out on your own. Yeah, for me, probably two things. One is having very limited funds, like coming from Mars where you're like, I need this thing. And it's like, okay, here it is to having no money. <laughs> um, that's been a big challenge. So when I first started, I actually did the pre-orders so that people would pay me up front um, a week before I would buy all my ingredients, make the ice cream and then give it to them on the weekend. So that was my initial challenge of getting the money first to make the product um and I think the other main one for me has been working alone so in my business I'm the only person who does everything and 
you might be able to tell, but I'm a very chatty person and I love people. I love being with people. So it's been really difficult to constantly, yeah, have to sort of motivate myself with my own energy as opposed to other people's energy. So that's been a big one for me. <laughs> and how have you, how have you sort of benefited? Has there been any um, benefits in terms of um, connections locally or collaboration that you've been able to sort of foster that that's helped you navigate some of those early challenges? Have you lent on anybody for help um, locally? Yeah, it's been actually really good. Um, I've actually been super thankful to you, Alex, for putting me in contact with a few people. Um, being able to chat to Nadia, who's on the call here, was really eye-opening for me and hearing about someone else's business um, and a few others as well. And it's really, I think for me, um, being alone like this has pushed me to make more connections. I've had some collaborations. It was meant to be during the lockdown um, with some cafes, even in Sydney, um, with some interesting kind of brands. Uh, so hopefully that can pick up after you know now that we're out of lockdown but yeah being alone has really forced me to say hi to people and kind of ask people what they think and, and get advice on you know what they've done in their business or what I'm doing in mine um, and it's yeah it's been really helpful just to speak to people um, going through their own thing because you can you can always take a little part of it into your own business I think even if the businesses have nothing to do with food or you know are a different style of food so yeah it's been really good on the coast and um, I'm lucky to have a lot of friends who do work in the food industry so um, yeah having those connections has been really big for me to continue I think. You're probably getting lots of, of hot tips from foodies about flavours you should be trying and on-trend ingredients and um, you know, cool bits of innovation I imagine there's no shortage of advice on, on what the next big thing is yeah exactly I get um so many messages of like can you make me a uh, this with this um some sound good and some sound just terrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah you probably have to politely decline some of the suggestions <laughs> yeah but there's so many I've got honestly I walk around with a book that I carry with me everywhere and I write my flavor ideas because they strike at any moment um so I just have this book <laughs> filled with flavors and things I want to do and yeah desserts that you have or the things that people make so it's really interesting to hear what people want to make I actually just on Instagram this week put up um a poll and you could vote on what kind of flavor I should make make next as like you know an Instagram family type flavor um so yeah everyone voted and that was really cool just to see what are people actually interested in because I'm into very weird stuff um and some people just like chocolate <laughs> it's great it's a great way to use that technology to get some sort of real-time research done and I suppose you're in a position where you could sort of rapidly prototype some flavors get it in front of a few people and work out whether that actually works or not and whether it's something that you might roll out um as a sort of standard line or a special feature yeah exactly I found Instagram a super helpful tool like I'll put a photo up of something I've made and all of a sudden like I'll get inundated with like yes this is good and I make it and it will sell out so um yeah having the social media aspect has been hugely important to my business awesome Ian's asked whether you could do a chili and cardamom ice cream have you thought about that Ooh, that would be nice. I just did pumpkin spice. So that was really like, um, that had a lot of spice, a lot of flavor going on. But yes, I actually have some cool ideas that I'm going to release on social media probably next week or the week after. Um, and it may have to do with chili. So follow me. <laughs> I reckon you and Ian maybe could get together and have a bit of a brainstorming session. I reckon that could be a lot of fun. I would love that. Amongst yeah. a whole bunch of others. Maybe we could all get together and have a brainstorming session and sample a little bit of ice cream as well. Yes. Well, actually, I wanted to say to you that um, I am going to be, well, I am looking to do some trials on some new site sort of topping soon. Um, so if anyone is interested in being a part of my panel, I would love to organise something. So, um, yeah, write a message in the chat and I'll, I'll go have a look <laughs> when we're stopped. Great stuff. All right. And, and Ian's also just asked whether you put your locations on socials, so the places that the, uh, the van visits in terms of how yes, we, can I get, we can get some ice cream. Yes, I do. So what I do is I try and promote it through social media, through both um, Instagram. Instagram is my main one, but I post everything from Instagram over to Facebook. 
so you can follow on both um and on those i do post um yeah the location i'll be for the week um in instagram there's a highlight that says find us this week and i put it straight in there so you can know where it is um i often do one at noraville which is 26 budgie road and i do that almost once a week um and then now that we are allowed out of lockdown i'm doing some more different all over the place so I'm actually involved this weekend with um, the Central Coast Council's uh, Eat Fest as a part of the Lakes Festival so I will be at on Friday from midday to 8 p.m I'll be at Long Daddy Foreshore and next Wednesday I'll also be at what's called the picnic reserve at the entrance from 4 till 8 p.m as a part people, of that. People can get all those dates on, on website or Instagram or Facebook or and all, all, all of those things. Yes, on all of those things. All right, good on you. Thanks, Liv. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for for the intro. It's uh, obviously a lot of energy around ice cream. And um, also, you can just, sign up to my email address, and I post all the dates on there as well. Sorry, great. that's the other one that's easier. No, good on you. Take take the opportunity for to, for the plug. It's awesome. Thank you. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, uh, we'll. Uh, I'm just looking to see whether there's any I've missed. Mikel's asking how you ship. The ice cream, um, I don't think that happens in your business at the moment, does it? It's all uh, direct to consumers via the van? Correct, yeah. So it's direct to consumer um, through the truck. So you can pre-order online and then you come and collect from the truck that weekend. So I would like to go into shipping. That's the like the main goal eventually. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's very hard to, to be so small and because I sell out locally, um, it's hard for me to make enough to ship just yet, but that is the plan. Cool. And lots of volunteers for ice cream tasting. So we'll make sure we, we um, capture those as follow-ups and shoot them through to you. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Liv. And um, the other fantastic um, founder who's recently joined our network is Mikel Overgaard. So Mikel's the founder of um, uh, Crickets & Co. He's got a really interesting business. And Mikel, it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about um, what you do and what you're growing at Bensville um, uh, and perhaps also just share some background in terms of how you got into doing what you're doing. Be awesome. Yes, for sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, yes, so my name is Mikel Overgaard. I am the founder and director of Crickets & Co. Uh, we are based out of Bensville on the Central Coast and we farm crickets, the, the insect crickets, um, We've been doing this for about a year and a half now. Um, we, yeah, it start at, up to until recently, we've purely been supplying the reptile industry, both uh, all over Australia, which is why I asked about the shipping because we've had all sorts of issues with shipping lately. But um, yeah, we've been supplying the reptile industry, at zoos, breeders, what have you. And about six months ago, we decided to move into the human consumption space, which is, I'm sure new to a bunch of people. Some people may have heard about it. There are other companies in that field in Australia, but it's very, very small. And, you know, it all started with it probably would have been two and a half years ago. I was living in Canada. I lived over there for about three. I'm from Denmark originally. A bit of an accent there, as you can probably hear in the name. Uh, but I spent about three years in Canada working for a company called SCOB, who work in agricultural farm management. And... Um, yeah, I was asked to go visit a cricket farm over there and didn't know that was a thing at all, uh, but it was to try and help them out with some issues with their air quality. And I was fascinated by it when I went and saw it, you know, coming from mostly the greenhousing, veggies, you know, poultry farms and that sort of thing. And I was, I was amazed by what, what, what we saw and, um, and we were able to help them out. And, and, you know, then after visiting that, you know, we stayed in contact with them a lot and, I went back there a few times and learned what they were actually doing and the benefits of uh, cricket protein and what, what how they were using it. Um, you know, we got to try it and, you know, it's you know, it's one of those things that there's obviously an ick factor with insects, especially here in the Western world. I'm sure a lot of you guys have been to Bali and Thailand and things where, you, you know, you get to eat them off the street at the, at the stalls and things. But yeah, over here, it's definitely not a common thing. So so I was just fascinated by it. And then when I came back to Australia, I was like, let's do this. Let's try and make this happen over here. I reached out to a, a few guys who were doing it in Australia. And we did a bit of a collab with another guy in South Australia. His name is Shoebugs, his company. And uh, yeah, and we're working together now. And we're just in the process of launching our 
first official human consumption food range. Um, we are doing a little bit already. We have been for six months just to powder, but doing actual food products um, from pastas to corn chips to cookies to um, yeah, pet treats. And what's the, for, for those that are trying to envisage what a cricket farm looks like, what is the, what's the technology? How, how does it work? What have you got on site there at Benzville? Yeah, so we are growing our crickets in 40-foot containers. It's uh, these style reefer containers, so insulated containers. Um, they're completely climate controlled with the equipment and the company I also work for, SCOB. Uh, so, you know, temperatures held within 0.2 degrees and humidity within 4% plus minus, so it's extremely accurate climate control. That's to encourage, you know, to have them in the, in the optimal climate stage throughout their whole life. Uh, so they're not wasting energy essentially on keeping themselves cool or hot. So they, you know, use all the energy to grow, uh, to make them as efficient as possible, to make them as environmental as possible, essentially, so you're not wasting feed on them. Um, at the moment, you know, for every kilo of feed we feed them, we get about one, 0.4 kilograms of crickets. So extremely efficient compared to the rest of the, the meat industry, if you will. What do you think of the big trends driving the growth in, I guess, awareness of alternate proteins like crickets and I guess you know, consumer appetite to, to try new things like this? Yeah, for sure. So obviously people have a mixed um, feelings about them. Uh, I completely understand it's a very <laughs> new food. And uh, I think especially probably, you know, the younger generation is definitely more open to it. You know, we sort of understand, or maybe not, but we've accepted that we need to make changes um, in life uh, that potentially our parents didn't have to do because, you know, climate change wasn't a, as big of a subject 30 years ago as it is now. So we've had a lot, a lot of positive feedback from, um, yeah, especially, you know, people under the age of, I'd say, 40. You know, we've had a few radio interviews. We've had some guys come out you know, Santa Cruz Advocate and these sort of groups and things. And, and uh, yeah, you know, on the radio, people call up and, you know, some of, especially some of the, yeah, again, older generation. So people are like, well, like, you know, you expect me to, you know, stop eating my T-bone steak and start eating crickets. Uh, it's like, no, no, not at all. But it's an alternative option, you know. Same concept as, you know, you be on meats um, and things like that. It's, I don't think anyone's trying to force anything down on anyone, but it's just alternative options to, yeah. So... Yeah, but it's gonna. There has been a lot of, yeah, you know, different vibes and things. But we've got a. We did our first sort of testing in uh, about three weeks ago, where we, we made a bunch of products. And we handed it around to around thirty different people, and um, you know, got their feedbacks, positives and negatives, and and you know, it was all people who have never tried insect-based meals before. So overall, a very very positive response. We're we're, we're really happy about it. Fantastic. And it, what, what do you think of the, are there any sort of barriers, any help that you need um, in terms of um, helping you accelerate scaling up? Is there any, any particular sort of standing in the way, any frustrations? Um, obviously dealing with um, yeah, live animals essentially uh, has its continuous battles. So if anyone's been involved in the agricultural industry before, I'm sure you can relate to that, especially dealing with uh, an animal that's not, commercially commercially recognized yet if you have an issue you can't really just call your local vet essentially and go hey listen uh, i've got some crickets are dying you know or, or whatever the issue may be that they, they won't really be able to help so it's a very small industry that can support you know we get most of our support out of europe there there's a lot of very large scale insect farms in europe um so that's a lot of guys we talk to are, are from there or from the states and the us have got some very large scale farming as well so that's where we get a lot of our support from and then we've got our own little group. We've got our we've got an insect protein association of Australia, which I'm on the board for as well. Um, so so we, you know we, we do a lot of networking and everyone really tries us to help each other out. Again, there's no we don't look at anything as competition. We're so small. It's just about trying to get it out there. Just fantastic. I'm hugely inspired by you working on on the edge, if you like. It's a really emerging part of food, and, and you're a pioneer in a, in a very a relatively small industry in Australia, but one which is enjoying huge investment um, and a lot of innovation happening in different parts of the world. I suggest Australia's not far behind. So, um, well done for for sort of biting off what is a pretty um, meaty, if you pardon the pun, challenge. But um, 
yeah, incredibly exciting if, you, uh, if you're able to get this right. And, uh, and fantastic to have this happening on the coast. I think it just brings a really interesting dimension to, to the food industry here on the coast. So it's awesome. Lots of cool suggestions. Cricket ice creams come up about 100 <laughs> times. So you and Liv need to sit, to sit together as well and, and, and uh, have a bit of a brainstorming session. Um, Bill's made a great suggestion um, to bake some uh, sourdough using cricket flour. Bill's got obviously some very deep connections into um, baking. Absolutely. Um, and some other cool suggestions there as well. So we'll capture that and make sure those notes come out to you, Mikel, as well. And uh, there's some follow up opportunities for, um, for collaboration. That could be really cool. Uh, Pete's asked, What's the diet of crickets? Is there a food waste opportunity? Oh, it's interesting you asked that. So at the moment we're feeding them. Um, it's a yeah, it's a cricket feed which is made out of uh, different grains. It comes out of Queensland, so it's specifically made for crickets. However, uh, as I mentioned, we have a few different containers, and at the moment one of the containers we're trialing purely food waste, uh, veggie waste. So it's clean, what we classify as clean waste. It's uh, put together with a few of the local sort of fruit barns guys. You know, when there's damaged fruits and things, we um, collect them and they go uh, they get process essentially just cut up and, and mixed and used for feed so that's something we're testing now there's obviously a few factors with that um that, because one of the big positives about crickets the people who are into them eating them is generally quite health conscious people and um you know by changing their diet that the nutritional value also changes from the, the powder so that's something that we don't know of yet because we haven't gone through the stage of getting them getting it tested uh, the nutritional value share but we're also doing some other trials we're working with some another group from the central coast here uh, where we're working with like muscle like the the, the ocean muscle uh, extracts and seaweed extracts and things to try and increase some of the nutritional value as, as well so yeah we've got a few different things going on uh, which is which is super exciting but to go down the route of also you know to incorporate the food yeah, food waste. I know we've got to be careful using the word food waste because people can get a bit cautious about that. But uh, yeah, that concept would be really, really great. And we do feed all of our crickets already uh, veggies as well as their standard feed. It's a, especially when they're young, it's a great way of getting them, uh, get moisture to them. They're, they're surprisingly hard to give water to when they're so small. Crickets are drowned. They're very bad swimmers. So. Well, Good on you, Mikael. I think we have to stop Peter Crane from putting comments in there because now he's suggesting oyster flavoured ice cream. So, Pete, your um, just a bit pause on your comments for a moment. I'm getting a, a little bit wacky, a bit distracting as well. Thanks, Mikael. Good on you, mate. Thanks for sharing. Um, and as I say, we'll make sure that um, some of the things that ideas have been put forward for collaboration, we, we push back to you. We'll, Thank um, you so much. No worries. Um, I'm going to move on to the next element. I'm just conscious of time because we do want to make sure that um, people people uh, can get back to work at 1.30. But one of the one of the strengths of the Food Alliance is our steering committee. So we've got a really um, valuable uh, group of uh, industry professionals and educators and uh, representatives from government who provide advice and support and some oversight as well to make sure that the Food Alliance is effective and we stay industry focused. Um, and each of those steering committee members brings a, a unique uh, perspective and skill set and network to the table, which which really adds value. And I'm pleased that we've got a couple of our esteemed Steerco members on the call, Mark and Nadia, and they've agreed to share a little bit about themselves and their background. Um, so Nadia, I might start with you, if that's okay. Perhaps just introduce yourself to the group, um, your role at Fires Creek and what you make and what your pathway um, to your current role has been as well would be cool. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes. Thanks, Alex, for the opportunity to say good day to everyone today. Um, in a nutshell, I describe myself as a yeah, I've got Fires Creek Winery in Holgate. Uh, we make wine from an array of um, botanicals, uh, fruit and flowers, and I'm actually experimenting with uh, using, actually first growing Indigenous plants and then making Indigenous wine so that there'll be something that can't be made anywhere else in the world. Um, Background, in a nutshell, probably a nerd across a greenie is probably where I'm at. I did a PhD in relationship marketing. Prior to that, um, I worked in the international marketing space and then tourism marketing space. And then um, 
kind of landed my dream job in owning a winery. Um, don't judge, actually don't drink that much, but I do, do lots of tasting, <laughs> just portion controls. Um, what else? That's kind of a nutshell of me, I suppose. Thanks, Nadia. So, I mean, obviously we're all aware it's been a pretty challenging 18 months or so. What, what are the things that you've had to done, had to do differently at Fires Creek to, to deal with the disruption and, and I guess, um, the inability for consumers to come and visit you at Fires Creek? Because the majority of your um, sales are through the cellar door. Um, what are some yeah, ways sure. that you've been working differently? Yeah, sure. So um, we had a double whammy um, of two lockdowns where we deemed non-essential services. So um, just come out of what four months of lockdown, and then then prior to that, the other three months, I suppose nine weeks. Um, so a little bit of a hit there, but actually uh, I just pivoted and used that time to maximise projects that I could see were going to be a benefit and. Um, um, created um, tourism experiences, which are kind of a, a, a buzz. I've been informed that you know that you should create um, experiences. So first lockdown, I uh, rebuilt the website, developed the four different experiences to meet particular four different specific target markets. So um, I've got to meet the winemaker tour. Um, I've got an Aboriginal bush tucker and wine tasting tour specifically for um, inbound market which actually this week's looking like it could be picked up by Tourism Australia. We've got, still got fingers crossed on that. Um, I've got a, a decadent style one for your couples and your, and your friends and family kind of thing, which is a um, chocolate and wine tasting pairing, which is served in the garden on crystal, in crystal glasses and, you know, it all looks lovely. And then I've got a, one, I needed a, a product that was suitable for your hands, your young groups of people, um, even work, Kind of your mice market so i developed a foraging and mixology workshop and that all well foraging mixology is probably the one that actually took off even more than i could imagine so that's been um a really fun workshop that's has kind of resonated a bit with people wanting to you know get in and do things with their own hands and experience things themselves so and you're doing some things with Indigenous ingredients as well, plants? Yeah, and so I've st I planted some um, different things in the, in the garden here because we grow about 40 different types of plants and we grow organically um, that we use to make into wine. So I've, I'm looking at some um, pepper, some myrtles, I've got some dianella, some um, daves and plums. So, um, and then I liaise with the elder I'm working with in regard to some natives that actually grow in this region. And I've got some in the, in the garden. It will all come down to kind of your, the growth of that plant, but also um, when I'm doing my wine making, the parts per million or the, the, the flavors that resonate through the actual wine and, um, and then the appeal to be able to market. So um, some, definitely your lemon myrtles, fantastic. It's a, it's a, fantastic plant and easy to use but some of the other ones have got a little bit more stringent to utilize but anyway that's a work in progress i think indigenous ingredients is an area where again consumers are becoming more aware and interested in trying mm. because of the flavor profiles but also yes. the the sort of nutritional benefits um so yeah in an area where there's potential for for innovation um not just in beverages but in, in food generally Good on you. Thanks, Nadia. Um, Mark, Harry, are you good to uh, do a quick intro? Sure Just can. A little bit about you, your role, what you do at Mars, um, and how you got to um, no worries, where you Alex. are. Thanks, mate. I'll take this mask off. We have to wear them on site as long as we're drinking. So I'll just take the occasional sip every seven minutes and I can <laughs> take the mask off because uh, they, they wear pretty thin by the end of the day. So Look, I've been at Mars for 15 years, um, started on a graduate program in our pet, pet care side uh, in Wodonga, and then two and a half years ago, wanted to work for the, uh, the, the fabulous Peter Crane um, up here. So I've moved up to Mars Food and uh, I've, I've now um, taken over some of the role that Pete, that Pete had as he left Mars and, and head up the R&D team here on site. Um, I've got 15 people in the team, um, ranging from packaging development through product development and, um, and raw material specification. Um, and we're a $300 million business that broadly sell, you know, flavored sources, herbs and spices, um, pasta sources, and a whole host of weird and wonderful condiments. 
Fantastic. And obviously COVID's had an impact on Mars. What are some things that you, I guess, taking some learnings from how you've been affected, uh, are there ways that you're building re resilience against future disruption? Are you setting up to do things differently in terms of, you know, I guess, processes or you know, how you're engaging associates? Yeah, look, it's um, it's definitely been the most challenging two years of of, of my career, Alex. Um, for starters, trying to do the majority the majority of our workforce are still working from home, so so that's been one of the major changes. And and I can speak specifically for my team, where we were previously had the ability to use our sort of industrial prototype kitchen. All of a sudden, all of our development work was done in our own kitchens, and our family became our 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 test our test markets. So. Um, you know that was one of the changes that we that we made. Um, I think the the impact of COVID on the office environment has broadly made a permanent change. So where where there was an expectation, I think as a line manager that your team would be on site the majority of the week. Going forward, we, the business has run very well over the last two years. We haven't had any major dramas. It's going to be very appropriate to have um, a very flexible workplace, and and the office layout will be completely different as we as we start to open the office up. For more associates going forward our office will be set up for people to come in and come out as they need it would be very rare for people to have a dedicated office space um, you know we have we have satellite offices all around the country we will review those and whether we need the the amount of desk space that we had because so many people are set up at home so that, i suppose that's probably one of the changes but the bigger one i'd say would be through our supply chain so as as mars has tried to improve its cost over the years um, we've gone to to source, you know, packaging items, for example, from lower cost countries, um, which has been, you know, at that point in time with supply chain working well, it's been a, a great strategy. But the challenge of COVID uh, and the, it is, is actually being realised in a bigger way in 2021 and into 2022 as we're seeing a global shipping crisis. So for us, it's about repatriating, repatriating, sorry, almost all of our raws and packs. Um, into Australian-based supply chains so we can keep the factory running. That's probably been the biggest learning. Uh, international shipping is just too hard to manage. Mm, thanks, Mark. I think, I mean, we could talk about insights and um, trends and growth opportunities. I'm just conscious I did want to allow some time for some general chat, so I might call it there. But thank you to yourself and, and, Sorry, sorry. and Nadia for introducing yourselves to the group and sharing a little bit of your perspective. So, um, a couple of minutes, if there are any general questions or comments, um, anyone want to throw anything out there? Anybody got any business news, anything exciting that they wanted to share? Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for that. So I'm happy to open the floor. Yeah, Alex, I was just going to say, uh, Michael here from Industry Training Hub. Um, obviously, I've been doing a little bit with uh, Frank at the moment, and it sounds like we'll probably uh, link up with yourself um, regarding these uh, events next year, because uh, and as uh, Petrina would have said, with uh, Petrina and Gillian, myself, we're all working closely together and uh, trying to bring together that whole piece around addressing, um, you know, probably a, a lack of education uh, regarding the manufacturing industry um, in schools here on the Central Coast. So that's going to be a large part of uh, of my scope of works, and uh, obviously bringing into play the likes of the Reef Officers Skills Broker Program, and then obviously working with you guys in the industry and trying to bring industry and schools together. So I think, um, yeah, there's, there's going to be some great synergies there between all of us, I, I would think, yeah. It's good on you, Michael. Thanks. There is a lot happening in that space. And you're really excited to be working with yourself right. and, uh, and a number of others on this call around that. Thanks, Alex. All right, Frank, I might, I might hand over to you. Have you got uh, some closing Well, actually, closing I just wanted thoughts? to I would, um, just um, follow up on a couple of things, um, particularly with COVID. So I just, during this call, I had a phone call from East Coast Beverages. Um, they can't get chef pellets. So they've actually had to stop producing because they can't get chef pellets. Uh, and I just had a chat with Steve on the chat and he's had the same problem. So, you know, this is, um, this is pretty major. Like, you know, a bit of timber that we uh, ship all our products, uh, particularly in supermarkets, um, that we can't get. Now, there's, there's a whole range of reasons. There's obviously the bushfires decimated a lot of the forest, the timber, 
and then uh, you know the COVID's had some impact as well. Um, so I'm not sure if um, any of the other businesses, uh, the, I suppose the bigger businesses probably will feel it more. Um, but um, yeah, they, um, I'll be following up with a few people just to try to find out what we can do about trying to secure pallets for the region because it is quite a major, major issue. Um, we had the same sort of discussion with um, uh, Family Fresh Farms up at um, Kalanura. They have a, they, they produce their heat using wood chip and of course the same problem. Uh, the timbers, well, a lot of it, the, the source of their timber and chip has been decimated. So they're um, in strife as well in terms of the resources. So um, anyway, look, I just wanted to, to throw that out there as something that, um, you know, that we have to, um, that these are going to be the ongoing issues, particularly around supply chain uh, that uh, businesses will uh, will have uh, and we'll need to, uh, you know, try to put a bit of focus on that and see what we can, if we can do anything. Um, but yeah, anyway, but look, apart from that, great session. Uh, thanks, Alex, for, for really uh, driving this. It was um, Alex's idea to bring all this together. So I think it's worked really well. Learned a lot about the different businesses in the region. I hope all you have had the same experience as I've had. As you know, we've just got such a, a vast variety of, of businesses here, and um, I think it's a great opportunity to keep running these sessions just to, uh, to highlight some of the some of these opportunities. And I was thinking, and I'll have a chat to Alex about this afterwards, is about how do we have a session where we bring all our products together and, and, and physically see them, taste them, all that sort of stuff, and then start talking about how can we. Um, um, integrate the products together. So we have this real Central Coast, um, I suppose, flavour around um, our products that, and a lot of collaboration between businesses. So whether it's cricket ice cream or, you know, uh, know spicy orange juice or something, I don't know. But, um, um, but these are the sort of things that, you know, um, when you get a whole group of people together uh, and the ideas started flowing, you know, like on the chat, you just... Um, I'm glad Alice could keep up with it because I couldn't. And um, yeah, uh, but keep Peter out of the uh, conversation because he'll just. <laughs> drill up the stuff. But uh, um, we need some. Of, we need some of that left field. Yeah, yeah, no, we need sure. some of it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, by the way, Peter Crane is also a director in uh, CCIC, so just uh, he came in a little bit late after the introduction. So, but anyway, look, we'll we'll get back to you um, on that. And the other thing I just wanted to ask, and, and maybe we'll send out a little bit of a survey about. Uh, having face-to-face -face meetings at some point and whether people are comfortable in doing that. That's it for me. Thank you. Good on you, Frank. Thanks. So I'll, I'll wrap it up. Thanks to everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Thanks for your active participation. Some great chat, some good questions. Uh, thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Mikel, uh, Nadia and Mark for your insights. I think, yeah, as Frank said, your involvement's been a really good springboard. We'll try and get more members involved um, and more people from our network involved in these kinds of sessions. Um, I did want to thank our sponsors and supporters. It's a pretty long list, um, uh, but they do a lot to help us both in kind and financially. And lastly, if you think there's a business you reckon could benefit from being part of the network, send them to our website, centralcoastfoodalliance.com or steer them towards Frank and myself for a chat. We Obviously, we want to continue to, to build this network and uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from anybody, any new businesses or um, um, anyone in the, the food um, and ag sector. It'd be really cool. When it's done, it's done, as one of my old bosses used to say. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. And, uh, yeah, see you all again soon. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks.